Welcome to Honkai Star Rail once again. Now, this video is going to be mm. kind of unusual. Memories I'm not actually going to be, be playing again. the game as such because I've done all the dailies I can do and all that jazz. But I am going to be reading uh, the character's story since I think I've unlocked every single one for the majority of my five stars. Yeah, I have. So. We'll read through. The, we'll read through these because I don't. Because I think, yeah. So we'll start with Black Swan because she's at the top of my list for being uh, alphabetical, alphabetical order. I think. Yeah, alphabetical order in my team. Okay. Sure. Character details. A memo keeper of the Garden of Recollection, a mysterious and elegant soothsayer. She often wears a warm smile and is willing to patiently listen to the words of others, thus using such means as a pretext to enter memories and gain omniscience, omniscience over certain matters. A lady passionate about collecting unique memories, yet the thoughts that guide her are hard to glean. Okay, go to story part one. She's quite an unusual kid, and I could sense it from the day she was born. It felt like nature itself was celebrating her arrival. The birds chirped, the moon and the sun were together in the sky. Together? The cards in my hand seemed to hint at the emergence of a soul steeped in nostalgia. Right from her early years, she had a fascination with stories from the past. She would delve deep into contemplating our origins, our creators, and even the very beginning of the world. Her questions would leave even the most erudite scholars scratching their heads. Sure, some of the kids might poke fun at her for asking such deep questions, but aren't those questions important? Life is akin to, to a winding labyrinth, where memory serves our sole companions, a mother's memories. Afflicted with amnesia, her mother struggled with forgetfulness, making it difficult for her to recognize her family or recall recent events. Clutching the diagnosis of amnesia, she held her mother tightly, attempting to read aloud from the, from the latter's diary. Her mother was physically present, but where was she in the realm of consciousness? She stayed by her mother's side until until the end of her life, realizing that her mother had been fading away <coughs> as her memories became fragmented. If her own memories of her mother were to ever become blurred as well, her mother would have completely slip away from her. Life is akin to a winding labyrinth where memory serves our sole companions. For the first time, she comprehended the profound meaning behind those words. Character Story Part 2 I arrived on this planet as an explorer. My usual tasks Im involved observing the flow of rivers, examining the materials of the city's bricks and tiles, analyzing the steepness of roads, and documenting the number and distribution of chimneys. These duties aligned with people's imagination of preserving a planet's memories. However, such efforts were far from sufficient. Once I started working in secrecy, I would often come across that girl. Sometimes sunlight would dance through the leaves as she walked beneath them, disappearing around corners once the street lamps illuminated the surroundings. On other occasions, her gaze would follow a carrier pigeon, which left the high priest's quarters in every Wednesday night, only to return the following morning to the palace's chief of the guards. A known political adversary of the high priest, occasionally she would, quiet, she would quietly observe rain trickling into the sewers scarred by artillery fired from the opposite shore, and sometimes waves would dampen her skirts while an elderly woman washing clothes by the river recounted the story of the previous sovereign as five illegitimate children. Few individuals, apart from us, understood what, that a planet conceals and safeguards its memories in such a manner. I trailed behind her until we reached a rock, a rock on the moor. I knew that it was time to invite her. What do you see? I asked, in a form visible to her. She pointed at a patch of weeds and the lingering traces. I see a stone, perhaps once part of a fireplace, but it must hold more significance. I nodded and assisted her in removing the weeds and dirt from the crevices of the stone. It was, a, it was once a monument, she murmured, gently caressing the engravings adorning its surface. Indeed, but the memory holds more significance. Thus, I revealed to her that the stone on the moor had once served as a fireplace, a monument before that, a flower bed, and even an altar. And before all that, it had simply been a stone on the moor. What price would I pay if I want to witness those memories? People will, re will remain oblivious to your presence unless you are willing to reveal yourself. Just as people fail to acknowledge the existence of black swans until they encounter one? Yes, just like that. Memo Keeper and Explorer's Memories. 
Memo Keepers travel to numerous planets, collecting the memories of each city they encounter. They're careful not to leave any trace of their presence, ensuring that nobody remembers them unless they come across someone with the potential to become a Memo Keeper, whom they then take away from the city into the vast expanse of the stars. Intriguing. Character Story Part 3 Many individuals obsess over the glory of the past and aspire to become Memo Keepers longing to live within their memories. Such individuals often degenerate, degenerate into unbridled cremators, distorting memories to suit their preferences. However, she is different. I've sensed her unwavering determination and profound respect for memories themselves. Following tradition, I asked her three questions for making her a memory keeper. Will you dedicate your whole life to the collection of memories? I will. Will you relinquish your physical form and embrace the transformation of self? I will. If one day you cease to exist, what legacy will you leave behind for the world? My memories. They held seeds from the past, destined for rebirth into the future. Memories come in various forms. Some are tri trivial and heartwarming, while others are grand and expansive. Some are gentle and meek, while others are wild and untamed. When she became a memo keeper, her memories became tranquil and serene, like the calm waves that finally found their distant harbour. A memo keeper's memories. What comes to your mind? The memo keeper asked. She opened her eyes. Fragments of memory swirled around her. People tend to believe that they are facing the present and the future, yet fail to realise that we are all, in fact, moving toward the past. Character Story Part 4 Location Pinaconi Date Guests And A sorrowful memory from this opulent memory adorned with ostentation and logging conceals an unknown sadness that will linger for years, influencing its owner for an extended period. A joyous memory from the traumatic memory is filled with vibrant hues of joy, confusion, and humor, but it can hardly be called true happiness, such as the future it portrays. A regrettable memory from the fleeting happiness in this memory is beautiful yet short lived, like a shooting spark from faded ashes. Cherish your limited moments, dear guest, for it informs me that it shall soon vanish. A vague memory from this memory is faint, chaotic, and disorienting, akin to an endless downpour with no respite in sight. I yearn to capture the future it points to, whether it be filled with rain or sunshine. Black Swan's memories. I saw the figure of a woman, gracefully leaping and transforming amidst images and patterns. No, I'm not crazy. I did indeed see her. I remember her voice, its velvety texture, and the colourful cards in her hands imbued with some sort of magic. Oh, and she invited me to partake in fortune-telling. She said... Whether you want to foresee happiness and misfortune in the future, retrieve lost possessions, or seek unexpected gains, all I need is an honest story, but the past and the future are overlapped on the same point of, on a, of a single circle. My head spun and she exuded such gentleness. I talked to her and she patiently listened to my ramblings. And then, following her divination results, I retrieved a lost mirror for a guest of, for a guest of the hotel. Oh, you asked what I said to her? Oh, nothing important. Just some rumours about the past. A native Pentaconi resident's memories. Currently, she journeys through various realms as a diviner, uncovering memories intertwined with her path and eons. She believes that those memories are as enduring as gems, impervious to the eroding forces of oblivion. Numerous memo keepers have ventured to Pentaconi, only to discover it as a mere illusory mirage dancing upon the water's surface. However, dreams, they represent a distorted form of memories, and shall delve into its depths and catch a fleeting glimpse of the buried memories before those memo snatchers and cremators arrive. So that's the end, that's all of Black Swan's ones. So now I will do, uh, I'll do one of, I'll do one of these calyx, um, one lot of these, and then, um, and then we'll go on, move on to, I think, Jingleo, maybe. So, uh, these, this is pretty easy to do. Did give it, yeah, that didn't quite take that. Out. Ready is eternal. Ready for death. Who lies? I should take all four of them out. Memories are ever beneath the waters lies an endless abyss. Who lies? I don't know. Protect all beauty. Who lies? Wow, I'm just using his special order. Protect all beauty. That was quick. That was wow. Okay. <laughs>
That was, well, that was over quick. Alright, let's go. Let's move on to... Yeah, Jingliu. I have not read any of these, by the way. These are all... Um, you should be as well. Character details. Former sword champion of the Lofu, and the reason behind the Cloud Knight's mythical reputation of impla impla implacable might. Now, her name has been wiped from the records, and she is a traitor of the Zian Show, walking on the fine line between sanity and Marastruck. Character story part one. A sword, three feet and seven inches in length, that weighs nothing, was not forged from any ordinary iron, but condensed from a shaft of sharp ice. It glowed with a dim light as if it were a silver of moonlight, a sliver of moonlight held in the wielder's hand. A sword three feet and seven inches of length, weighing about seven caddies, hold it in your hand and stab the sharp end toward the enemy. With a gentle flip of her hand, the woman in armor called her sword. As if alive, the sword leapt out of the weapon rack, sliding into a grasp, and out of its sheath in one fell swoop. The blade then stabbed into the air beside the girl, humming intently. You got that yet? If so, go fight the most common war beasts in the Boris and use in the ground forces. Once we've killed ten bloodshot war wyverns, I'll consider you the first lesson completed. She remained silent, her eyes darting left and right. It's her first time stepping out of the ward since being rescued, and the first time ever in her life she had touched a weapon known as a sword. I have dismissed the healers and helpers. They won't come to you without my orders. The calamity in Changcheng left few survivors. Don't know what you have been through before the rescue arrived, but I don't want to see you wallow in past horrors like this for the rest of your life. It's okay if you don't want to talk. You can speak th with this. You can use this to vanquish the monsters that took everything from us. There are now few things as wondrous as this left in the world. The woman in armor remained composed, her gaze cast onto the long sword by the girl's side. The mirror-like blade showed her her reflection. Then a swarm of razor shards swirled up a tempest, swirled up in a tempest, dragging the girl into her past. Dimly lit sky, the demonic planet named Rahu was wailing and singing, hurling towards everyone with lance and mountain ablaze. Wow, okay. I didn't realize we learned to have a different planet in, this, in these backstories. <sighs> On the streets, people were screaming, writhing, and rolling in apocalyptic despair as the golden tendrils sprouted and grew feverishly in every orifice of theirs. Holy shit, she watched everything unfold, paralyzed. Her organs felt like they were boiling. Something suddenly surged and churned in her core ass, like a reap, like a ripe wheat grain about to burst out of its husk and swell into a fall to affinity. The mountains hurling toward her face made her realize she was, she was but a mayfly, but to perish at the mere flick of an emanator's fingertip. In that split moment before death claimed her, she grabbed the only three she could hang by. A sword, three feet and seven inches in length, weighing about seven caddies. <laughs> Character story part two. A sword, six feet and five inches in length, weighing fourteen caddies. This is a cloud knight great sword that must be wielded with both hands. The edge contains enchanted fire that can split open the mecha beast's inert armor at the moment of contact. There are twelve flying swords providing support, connected into a spinal meridian from the acupuncture points of Dezui, Dezui to Yaoyangguan. I, I don't know if I pr pronounced that right, but I apologize. <laughs> she needed only to think for these swords to instantly span out like a blistering storm. She was still unfamiliar with the way of the sword. She still had lots of things to learn. The woman in armor had no time to teach her more before the woman had, was tasked with leading the army on the field. Therefore, the girl's second lesson is to be learned on the battlefield, taught by the enemy she would fall. A stab is easy, but swift monsters won't run into the sword's tip on their own or let the girl execute them. That is how she learned to slash. Entangle is next. Against monsters with overwhelming strength, the girl learned how to parry with the back of the sword to deflect enemy attacks. She believed she had learned enough of the sword and therefore leapt onto the mecha beast war pawn Gigantes. That would dwarfed her over at least ten times over. She broke all the swords she brought with her and only managed to leave a few dozen cuts on the opponent's gigantic body. She was backed away by an enormous hand lying in the blood-soaked mud of the battlefield. She was once again swallowed by horror. The split moment before death claimed her, she finally understood that even the art of swordplay had its limits. An arrow filled with blazing fire blew off the Gigantus' head. Get up, the woman in armor looked at her. I don't want to learn the sword anymore. It's useless. Useless? It's pretty useful in my hands. It's the wielder who was useless. If you don't learn the sword, what do you want to learn? The alchem alchemical arrows on the pilot star skiffs? The blazing fire flung by divine crossbows? Or the artillery of the Zhu Ming Xianzhou? Xianzhou? Such instruments would also be enough to destroy the demonic planet. You want to learn about them? Fine, those things can kill the enemy even from beyond visual range. I just don't understand why you insist on teaching me the sword. The general of the smallest pawn, every clown knight starts by learning the sword. 
The various constructs provided by the Artisan Ship Commission can certainly kill the enemy for you, but those deeds are to the merit of the art material rather than the person. If there comes a day that the quivers run empty and the, the scar stiffs crash, that the scar stiffs, the star stiffs crash, that the orimatons freeze, who will protect you and I then? Who will protect the Zen Zhou? Hold the sword. Remember, it would not be a true fight for humanity if Cloud Knights didn't wield swords and march onto the battlefield themselves, rather than letting Ingenia do the work for us. We will show our final victory to those inhuman abominations by our own blood and prowess. The woman in armor turned and departed, leaving the girl in the broken sword in the training room. A sword, two feet and one inch in length. Only its broken fragments remained. Character story part three. A sword, five feet... Five feet? A sword five feet in length, weighing as heavy as 3,000 caddies. The ebony blade shimmers with a sanguine sheen. Sanguine sheen. The sword was forged from the non-stop tempering of extraterrestrial laws, a complete deviation from conventional weaponry. Untamed and unyielding, the sword mirrored the defiance and hubris of its short-life species creator. Once she had only swords as her companions, but now she found herself with many friends. The day she was crowned as the sword champion, the craftsman attended the ceremony in a black garb and cast out the sword he bore. The sword sank deep into the ground, leaving only its hilt above the soil. All attendees were shocked. Only the sword champion of the law who cloud knights can tap into the full potential of the sword I've crafted. He gave a toothy grin. The high elder of the law who is haughty and detached as the high moon in the sky, felt an irresistible temptation to duel with her upon witnessing a peerless martial prowess with just one simple glance. The spear and the sword sparred for many years without a conclusion, until she cleaved ocean ties in twain with a single clash in, tr in the Dragon Vista Rain Hall, and finally won the High Elders a concession. A well-travelled nameless who had flown across the cosmos had steered vessels for her, bringing divine nectar from the other side of the universe to share with her, and gazed upon the scintillating stars by her side. Or cut down even the stars in the sky. She still vaguely remembers the boast she made in moments of inebriation, that burning pla planet rushing towards her in childhood memories, that horrible nightmare that wouldn't let her go. Those scenes are no longer so terrifying. This is the first time she understands what wanting to live means in all her years of y wielding a sword. For this moment, she was simply someone ready to die. And there was a student. She recalled the first time they met. This young but devious child had asked the same questions as she did. Master, why do you insist on wielding a sword? There are thousands of weapons out there that can kill an enemy. If you want to destroy that planet, the Zoom In can probably do it with its artillery. This is like asking a poet why they wrote their poems. There are many ways to express oneself, but this is not this is the only way for me. Now he doesn't hear he has also become a shining star amongst the cloud knights. She doesn't have a master anymore. The woman in armor perished on the battlefield and can construct and can instruct no longer. Nor does she need a master anymore. She knows everything there is to know about swords. They're a part of her body. They're the intake and release of breath as she walks and sleeps. People call her the tri transcendent flash, the pinnacle of sword masters, a once in ten millennia hero. However, she knows that her sword is still not enough to cut down the star in the sky. Even if she is holding the greatest sword in, in all the Zen Zhou, a sword five feet in length, weighing as heavy as 3,000 caddies, the only blade shimmers with a sanguine sheen. Character Story Part 4 A sword, five feet in length, weighing as heavy as 3,000 caddies, the ebony blade is covered in cracks and the tip is broken and lost. Amid the countless wars, she wielded the sword and, alongside her comrades and disciple, battled her way into the vast ship, decapitating the wolf-like head of the Boris and Warmatar. She also climbed the sky-piercing flying citadel, clipping the wings of the feather guards. She fought the iron cavalry of the ho Hi, what? Sealing all the riders of the six-legged steeds into steeds into prison. Whichever way her sword swung, no abomination could escape death or imprisonment. She had never expected that she would be able to she would be point she would point the sword at her lifelong friend. She gasped gasped but she gasped, barely holding her wounded body together. Far away, deeper in the delve, there came the anguished roar of a dragon, as if pleading for death. She watched as the arrogant craftsman fell into the mud and walked up to him like a wraith. I should kill you first, but you will have your own torments to bear for all eternity. She pointed the broken sword at the high elder. Impossible, the preceptor said, the blood of my race and the soul of my ancestor should have created another high elder. All this, it shouldn't be like this. If your death can return the, everything to how it was, I would do it. But you need to tell me right now what, where that dragon's weak point is, the top of its head. The half draconic abomination swam through the air in blasts of lightning, its body through it, its body, enough to swallow the very horizon, sundered yet another floating isle.
Its wails were as loud as the clamours of a thousand clashing swords. She felt her core air spoiling like a ripe wheat grain about to burst out of its husk and swell to infinity. She saw herself trapped in childhood nightmares again. The ominous planet is following her overhead, and she, but an insect, cannot even struggle. The woman tore off a spread of black silk from the edge of her skirt and covered her eyes. The thunder struck. She leapt up with her sword towards the draconic abomination. In dreamlike illusion, she felt her flesh surpass its limits, beginning to disintegrate. It was as if innumerable silken threads bound her, taut across every limb and bone, each one slicing through the last vestiges of her consciousness bit by bit. Suddenly, she heard those words. I'll cut down even the stars in the sky. The moment she finally grasped the sword she had been seeking all this time, the sword that can transcend all restrictions, it was a sword she had been familiar with for years. It was not forged from any ordinary iron, but condensed from a shaft of sharp ice. It glowed with a dim light, as if it was a strand of moonlight held in the wielder's hand. A sword three feet and seven inches in length, and weighs nothing. Fun. That's all four of Jingli's ones, so let's do it this again. Let's um, do another one of these. Okay, I'll grab, I'll grab, uh, fucking Argenti again. Tedious. My guiding light. Rigid and fleeting. Stand down. Later, me. Until I stay. Protect all beauty! Nowhere to run. Protect all beauty! Ready for death. Beauty is eternal! Until I Okay, this should be over like. Protect all beauty! Now. Tedious. There they go. Okay, who's next? I think it's Fahua. Yeah, here we go. Story. Carriage details. While this foxy and girl may seem fragile and weak, she is actually a judge in training of the Ten Lords Commission, responsible for capturing evil. The judges sealed a heliobus named Tail onto her tail, making her a cursed one with a tendency to attract evil beings. Despite trembling at the sight of evil spirits, she is always entrusted with the arduous task of eradicating their presence. She is well aware of her incompetence, but lacks the courage to resign, so she forces herself to press on despite her fear. <laughs> Character story part one. When Fafa awakes at the Ten Lords Commission, she finds herself confronted not with novelty but with an atmosphere that sends shivers down her spine. Sensing her unease, a white haired judge addresses her with gentleness. Tell me, little girl, how did you come across that fire? It was along the roadside and about to extinguish, so I, I wish to help it. So you put that fire on your tail? Why did you do that? I, I don't know, it happened before I realized it, I'm so sorry. No need to apologize, kind hearted girl. However, you'll be under our custody from now onwards. Th thank you, madam. Call me Hanya. Uh, thank you, Madam Hanya. I, my name is Fahua. The thoughts of the judge named Hanya wanders back to a few days ago. The Tenor's Commission received a distress call, and she took on the task of locating the foxing girl who was about to be consumed by a heliobus. At the moment, Hanya couldn't repel the heliobus by force without causing harm to Fahua, who was still a little girl. As a result, she had to seal the heliobus onto the girl's tail. Fortunately, the heliobus decided to start the position from her tail, giving Hanya a chance to save her life. Was my decision right or wrong? Hanya mutters to herself. Character story part two. While the heliobus is short-tempered and arrogant, he is not impossible to communicate with. He cannot tolerate Wafwa sobbing and wailing, and didn't re quite understand how Foxy and socialize. For example, he didn't understand why the girl would be ostracized by a classmate due to her tail being on fire. You! Tear off that talisman! No! Madam Hanya said the talisman, talisman must not be removed under any circumstances. Did you hear them? How dare they mock me? I've never been humiliated like this before. No, they're not mocking you, but me. Then you go teach them listen yourself. If you can't avenge me for this insult, then don't talk to me anymore. But I'm scared. Alright, fine. You know what? Just take a deep breath. Take a mind. Go blank and don't think about anything. I handle this problem for you. But, Madam Honey, I said the talisman must not be removed. Don't worry. Just do as I say. When she regained consciousness, the legend of the possessed demoness was already circulating. After that, well, I went and found out a lot about the Heliobus' past. Eons ago, a Heliobus named Ignamar was defeated by a lofty gen general and fragmented into numerous shards, then sealed in the creation furnace. 
This particular shot escaped and he represents the arrogant side of Ignamar and wouldn't, cons wouldn't condescend to possessing anything, living as a vagabond for centuries, until Wahua chanced upon him in, this, in his utter exhaustion. Then I'll call you Tail to avoid unwanted attention. The hero says nothing, his silence being a sign of acquiescence. Character story part 3. This one's another short one. Her one's pretty short. When Hua was taken in by the Ten Lords Commission, the judges initially wanted to ensure that Tail wouldn't cause any trouble. Gradually, as she familiarized herself with the deuces at Spirit Fairer, she became acquainted with the various evil spirits documented by the Commission. Madam Shui Yi, uh, how about the talismans I prepared last time? They were great, very effective against astral spirits. Ha, ha, ha. Glad to know that. I was worried if it wouldn't work well. Why didn't you try them yourself? No, 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 I'm too scared. You know, Hua Hua, most of those evil spirits are actually ter extraterrestrial creatures or malevolent sentient beings that exist in various forms. I know what they are, but I'm still so afraid, Madam Shui Yi. Maybe I'm not really cut out for this job. Well, only you know the answer to that. Hua Hua is not okay with her timidity. She struggled to muster the courage needed to confront the evil spirits. She stayed up late watching horror comedy films in an attempt to strengthen her nerves. <laughs> Me. Me. I knew we were alike. <laughs> well, she got with dark circles. She invested in the latest scientific exorcism tools to enhance her abilities, but only left her with empty pockets. Tail sneered at the futility of her efforts, finding ways to make sarcastic remarks and mock her. To be honest, Tail is the scariest of them all. However, in Shui Yi's eyes, Hua Hua has long ceased to fear Tail. Character Story Part 4 Final one. For Hua Hua, anyway. Initially, Tail was no different from any other Heliobi, intending to devour Hua Hua and take possession of her name and identity, stealing all of her desires and emotions. Later, Tail found pleasure in witnessing Hua Hua's frustrations and her failures. Anyway, I'm not in a hurry to devour her at all. She can't escape me after all. Tail, Tail, help, help me! It's none of my concern. What did you say back then? Oh, you've got to stand on your own feet. This is the perfect chance, isn't it? No, I'll stand on my feet next time. Please help me. A reminder, once you die, I'll be free. But well, you was finished what I start, I won't leave until I devour you. You're a judge of the Ten Lords Commission, but you've neglected your duty and allowed these monsters to wreak havoc on the Zinja. What a disgrace! Hey, what do you think you're doing, small fry? I'm the one who can, I'm the only one who can... Oh, wait, who is it? I'm the only one who can scold a roar. What a physical, huh? Good, good, you asked for it. Since being possessed by a tail, Hua has become highly sought after by evil spirits, like moss or flame. Hua Hua always blames Tail for her ominous title as the cursed one, and Tail finds having a host like Hua Hua can be frustrating at times. However, years have passed, and Tail hasn't harmed Hua Hua in the slightest. Although Tail never failed to help her after witnessing enough frustration, he denies any, any notion of friendship. Issued by the Ten Lords, Hua Hua the Spirit Fearer has performed extraordinarily during her tenure, and has proven to be reliable for crucial tasks. tasks. She is hereby promoted to the position of judge. The Ten Lords Commission decreed her promotion and thus begun Hua Hua's new tenure as a trainee judge. And that's the end of Hua Hua's one. Now, I'll do another one of these. And then we'll do one. One more. We'll do one more character and then we'll end this video off. Tedious. And fleet. Stand down. My guiding light. Beauty is eternal. Destiny isn't chosen. Uh. Until I, I will protect all beauty. Later. And flee until I, I will protect all beauty. <laughs> beauty is eternal. Must until I should be able to give them all this. Protect all beauty. Yep, there we go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we can. This, this guy, get that, play team. Alright, now, who do we have left? Oh, Bailu. Okay. Information, story.
Code details. A vivacious young lady of the Vidyadora race. She is known as the Healer Lady due to her expertise with medicine. She often dishes out unorthodox prescriptions, such as stay well hydrated and get a good night's rest. Baru cannot bear to see people suffer, and that's why I'll see her with her eyes shut tightly as she cures ailments. As long as they're cured, that's all that matters, right? Part 1. Alchemy Commission Collected Treatment Histories, Volume 48, Case Study 1246. Presiding Physician, Bailu. Patient, Yu Zhui. Female Foxian, age, age 62. Complaint. Accidentally ate a chocolate drop sold by an out outworlder trader. Experienced extreme thirst, leading to excess drinking. Aching all over, particularly in the stomach. Shortness of breath and loss of big clumps of tail hair. <laughs> Diagnosis, food poisoning. Prescription, bitter ginseng. One mace, raw licorice. One mace and one candarine. Five grain jade elixir. One bottle. Things you should know about forbidden foods. One copy. Usage boil, bitter ginseng, and licorice on the five grain jade elixir until reduced to half volume. Strain to remove dregs. Drink as much as you like until you vomit. Copy, copy out the pamphlet. Things you should know about forbidden foods. 500 times until it's stuck in your head. Remarks, classic case of food poisoning, visceral les lesion, lesions, already healed with draconic ica, should suffice to make a medics as prescribed, which will effectively remove any res residual poison throughout vomiting. I should further notice that every everyone knows that even the strongest, hardiest, li long life Foxians cannot eat chocolate. They can't eat chocolate? Oh my god. Also, for minor ailments such as this, do not make the patient wait too long. Just wake, just wake me up. Moreover, couldn't you find me some more challenging cases? Are you trying to waste my talents? <laughs> Funny. Part 2. Alchemy Commission Collected Treatment. Histories, Volume 73, Case Study 582. Presiding Physician, Bailu. Patient, Jin Yu, female vid Vidyadra, aged 13 days and 4 hours. Complaint. Patient undergoes cycle of hatching rebirth every few months. Her growth is a hundred times faster than a normal Vidyadara. Diagnosis, diagnosis. Rebirth abnormality. Extremely rare. A one in a million condition. D prescription. No available medicine. Drink plenty of hot water. Usage. Not applicable. Remarks. Well, this is one of those difficult cases. Sort I, unfortunately, am unable to treat. The mechanism underlying the hatching rebirth of Vidyadara remains a mystery. Some healers take the view that Vidyadara use the rebirth cycle to repair injuries sustained during their long life cycle, but such a notion, notion clearly does not apply to this patient's situation. I have tested her blood and marrow and had her ingest translucent, swarm, translucent swims to allow a thorough examination of her brain, but I found no diseased parts. Oh, what a marvel, marvel life is, even after a long life Long life species exempt from aging and death are not entirely immune to the ravages of disease. It's the same as regards my own health. It's now six or seven years since I first sprouted horns, but I've not grown taller in that time. I'm sure it is because I have those horrid perceptors watching over me all the day long. If a child does not get out to run about, how will they grow tall? Heels who read this case study. When will you release me? I am not some truly wicked n near do well. Why am I so closely guarded? It makes me so very, 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 very angry. A scowling, horned face has been drawn at the foot of this page. Part 3. Alchemy Commission Collected Treatment Histories, Volume 128, Case Study 39. Presiding Physician, Bailu. Patient, Jing Wen. Males the show native of indeterminate age, though the Ten Lords Commission surely knows. Complaint, tightness of chest and shortness of breath. Jazziness, eyes too tired, keep open. This consultation is a routine repeat checkup. Diagnosis, keep inside the seat of divine force for far too long. Prescription, one serving of garlic infused pork, one serving of crisp melon and diced chicken, one serving of pork slices and fish sauce, one serving of granny chin's tofu, one crispy suckling pig, and one cup of hunter mouthing tea. Oh, poor pig. Usage, just eat, he'll make him feel full. Then naturally he'll want to get out and about to work it off, which will also improve his mood. Remarks. The general comes to see me about his health every year, complaining of symptoms such as tight chest and shortness of breath, or struggling to keep eyes open and wanting to give him a checkup. The movement of the general's chi is extremely vigorous, and there are no signs of affliction by strange diseases or being stricken with Mara. Though such things are the province of the Ten Lords Commission, I always exercise special caution in, his, in this regard. It is my view that he is simply bored senseless and has slipped out of rove about when he found some free time. If that were not the case, they sh why show up every time with a box of sweet meats, nuts and candies and whatnot, to plunge himself down and start shooting the breeze with me? How is my health? Have I had any dreams lately? How have I been eaten? He's more like the doctor than I am. I do very much enjoy chatting with the general. He's not like those old so-and-sos, no grand ears, likes to joke and tease, and he often tells me about the parts of the world he's been on expeditions to. All sorts of marvellous stuff. How I would love to leave doctoring behind and head off to the ends of the earth with sword in hand. Part 4, final part. Greetings, esteemed receptors. Star calendar. Day of 
month. Routine examination of Lady Bailu, concise notes as follows. Follows. Still no physical change in the High Elder. She has not grown. This is not unusual. This slow development is common among Vidyadra. I am more concerned about her having no dreams than the slight growth of her body. All past High Elders, after receiving the Orb of Abyssum and the Transmutation Arcanum, will re-experience the events of their Dragon Ancestors' lives and dreams. The Office of Deep Sources is charged with trans transcribing, telling, and annotating these dreams, and their files run into an enormous number of volumes. Although such dreams tend to be fragmentary and difficult to understand or interpret, it is after all the only way our kind have of coming close to permanence. Yet Lady Bailu has experienced nothing of the sort. It is apparent that either her dragon heart is in some way damaged, or the transmutation arcanum has not been carried through in full. Furthermore, since the High Elder has dem already demonstrated her powers of calling lightning and commanding the waters, I have instructed one of our finest crafters to make the dragon horn pillory to shackle her tail, to prevent a loss of control over her powers and a repeat of the disaster of the sedition of Bible Lune. Also, we received a, miss a missive from Kai Lorem, Venti of the Yao Ching, some months ago. Genshin? Genshin Impact reference? Inquiring, inquiring into the present condition of Lady Bailu, I have implied as you instructed, esteemed elders. The gist of my reply was that Lady Bailu is still young and in need of the assistance of the preceptors. Only after her coming of age ceremony will the preceptors confer the title of Imbibed Lune on her. Respectfully yours, Yunio, attendant to the High Elder. Interesting. Bible Lune and Bible Lune. Hmm. Uh, let me check my name is Sonna real quick. Let's just do two of these, like, so quick. Like, super, super fast, and then I'll be cool. This is like this is the down. weakest they can be. My oath, wretched and fleet. Tedious. Later, Dead. Nowhere to run. My guiding. Destiny is ill tidings manifest. Okay. My oath is to suck me in return. Everyone. Until I I will protect all beauty. Battle over. One more. My guiding wretched and fleeting. My oath is beauty is eternal. And These are really quick. Beauty is eternal. Do the same thing. Stand up. Huh? My guide. Wretched and fleeting. Tedious. Final one. Until I end it off with a bang. Protect all beauty. Hydrilla. Hydrilla. Okay, there we go. We can do this now. Nice. Okay. Now, let me just go into here real quick. Go into freaking traces. You. You. Can only make two. Yeah, no, so I can't do that. Oh, God. Fuck. Fine, we'll do this. We will do this one, and I'll do it on the easiest difficulty so it doesn't take too long. Oh, actually, no, I'll do it on the second to easiest difficulty because then I get like, what, three, I think? So let's just. Oh. In fact, I might do two of these out. Okay, yeah. Grab you again, Argenti. I hate these bugs. They're so bloody annoying. All will be revealed. Damage flame. 
from Grand Pass. Activate both of those. When enemy, in, when enemy target enters battle, there's a 65 base transfer to inflict up to the one stack of Arcana. Okay. Dark Fire Essence. It's probably a way to get it. Yeah, Calyxes. You can get Dark Fire Essence and Calyxes. Two sprouts of life. It's not enough though. Now I can do just this one. Hmm. 
editor, then to the support, then to ultimate. Alright, yeah, so that's the end of the video. This is the actual end of the video. I, uh, I want, I want to say, but hold on, let me just make... Three of those. Deal wind damage equaled up, uh, equaled up to 45% of what was max HP to a single enemy. Okay, cool. Yep, nice. Alright, yep, so this is the end of this video. I do hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you guys in the next one. A bit of a different, different video, but yeah, I still hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye. Yeah.